people want to um they want they like the idea of reducing their taxes right and that's what most people call me about so if you're running an s corp and you have to do it sometimes because you have employees so it's it's easier just to do an s corp an s corp is filing tax returns so typically it's a limited liability company and the accountant said hey uh File a two five 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 with it with your with your tax return or report in a, cer a certain way so that you cover employees and you're able to get workman's compensation and all these things insurance and all these things and that's fine but sometimes uh, you want to reduce the tax liability and the way you would do that simply is that you would put a holding company in between the S corp and the income source so that would be your merchant processor or your insurance payer whoever's going to pay the insurance claims that you're making for your patients if you're a chiropractor for example or your customer or your clients or your whatever if you're a dentist so we, we use a payment processor and we hold the money there and then all the operating costs are paid to the s corp and that's how we reduce the uh, the tax liability um, sometimes you can actually change your tax treatment by simply moving over your income stream to the new company so the old company's filing tax returns or you're claiming the its income on your Schedule C. Uh, and then to change that, you would simply move the cash flow to the new company and you would dissolve the other company and then resume that way. The beneficial interests stay the same. So it's just a what I call a reorganization, okay? That allows me to do certain things where I don't have to uh, have any discussion with the accountants. <clears throat> they don't have to change what they're doing. <clears throat> Everything is pretty smooth. So what I'm really doing is I'm isolating a financial risk or liability or something that's causing a loss to the company that doesn't have to be there. And I'm giving that owner of the, of the business the ability to do what he wants with the money instead of having it forcibly taken from him, like, for example, in an IRS levy. So um, but anyway, so that that would be an example of what we're talking about. And then we get into things like um, uh, I talked to several people this week where um, they had they had money. Uh, set aside maybe they got an inheritance or they had some cash from cryptos that's starting to happen where people are calling me now and they're starting to get some gains and uh they don't have a plan on what to do with it and some of them want to continue speculating and i have to say cryptographic currency for most people buying it is a speculation there's nothing wrong with that just understand what it is it's not an investment an investment is buying something that makes money on a regular basis and yeah there's volatility and there is an aspect of speculation in buying an asset uh, investing in real estate, there is some that aspect in there, but it's measurable. It's it's something that you can you can manage and you can calculate. With cryptos, kind of not so much. Okay, you can it's a good guess. Now there are some people that are really good at forecasting pricing, and even those people will tell you that they're pretty good at about forty to sixty percent of the time, somewhere in there, maybe forty percent of the time, uh, and they they know how to take the risk in such a way that they can build up their their value, their their holdings. Okay, they can do it over time. So, um, this the reason why I told you the story about Mr. Ferran is because we were talking about reallocating money or resources. And so, the way I look at it is, some people want are so eager to pay off old debt. So it's fine if you want to do that, but it's not a really good use of capital. A good use of capital would be something like if I have the ability to pay off an old debt it's probably better to put that money toward an asset. Oh, that's where we open up this you know, can of worms. Oh my gosh, John, John, that sounds great, but why? I, I, I don't know what that is. I'm really comfortable speculating on cryptos, as you say, or buying gold. Okay, that's not really an asset, okay? Uh, precious metals is just a way, it's a buffer. It's a way, it's a stepping stone between one type of risk, like having cash, that's a risk into itself. And then, if you don't know what asset to get into, gold is the good go-to before you get into the asset. That way you can lose less, right? If, rather than being the dollar. So um, so let me just give you a couple examples of what I suggested to some people. So one, one example would be, let's say I had some cash. I'm not sure what to do with it. Let's say I just inherited $150,000. Um, and I, my thinking is, if, if I pay off credit cards, let's say I paid $40,000 in credit card debt. Guys, can, I can easily do that. In fact, I could probably negotiate something with them, right? I can maybe get it down to 28000 I could probably hire a service and do it that way. I'm still going to have a tax liability for the unpaid amount, and I'm going to pay the service to help me do this, like a, a debt settlement company, okay? And the debt settlement company will instantly become my creditor. It'll be my new creditor. I've seen these contracts, and I've seen how they work. It's not a good situation to be in, in my opinion. It can work. I just don't think it's a good use of my time or money to do that, and so I don't recommend it to my clients, and I do 
criticize that. So one thing I would consider doing is instead of paying off old debt is look for something that can make money and let's take something that's lower risk, but let's get it. Let's get into the real estate area. So one of the things you can do, there's two things that I recommend. One is look at um, tax lien certificates and tax deeds. Now, half and half, we have 50 states. So half of the states are tax lien certificates. These come from judicial foreclosure states like Illinois and Florida. And then tax deeds come from trust deed states like California. And what happens is the uh, tax collector, the property appraiser, and the tax appraiser will auction off a property. Well, before it, it auctions the property for foreclosure, it'll auction off the claim of the taxes on the title of the property. That's what it does, actually. It auctions off the claim to somebody else who will buy the claim. That way, the county or the state doesn't end up owning the property. It's not supposed to do that. So someone will come along and buy the, uh, the, the certificate at a rate. Now, for example, Illinois, its tax lien certificates um, are a statutory rate of 36%. So if you, ideally, if you bought the certificate, you could be making 36% per, on your money. So if the you know the principal is ten thousand dollars, the debt was ten thousand dollars, and now it's you know you're you're getting thirty six percent per year is how it works. Um, that doesn't mean you're going to get thirty six percent because there's a discount rate, but you're going to get a pretty high return. And what you're doing is giving yourself the ability to foreclose on someone's property, but that's not what you're trying to do. You can do that, but what you're trying to do is get that homeowner to pay you a regular income, and that's just simply a sales process. Okay, so you just send a letter and say, look. Uh, Either I can foreclose on your property or you can make a payment arrangement with me, which is going to be. And typically they're going to do a payment arrangement. If you're friendly enough, they'll do it. So what I'm saying is this is something that can be done from your keyboard. Okay. You don't have to go out and uh, go look at real estate and things of that nature. If that's scary or, in, 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 you know, intimidating to people, you can buy tax lien certificates from people who are selling tax lien certificates, people who have portfolios of tax lien certificates. You can buy the entire portfolio. You don't have to buy one or two at a time, um, but you can. And there are services that will actually send the letters that are the best written letters. They'll send them to all the people. So you don't even have to do that. So I think putting your cash into something like that is really nice because here's the measure. If I have. I'm looking at my whole financial situation, okay? And I have this large debt over here and I've got some cash to work with. I'm going to put the cash over there, not into the debt, unless it's going to pay me a return, okay? I don't want to make it go away per se. I don't care about that. I want to get into something that's going to offset that. Now, when I do it that way, my net worth is going to go up. That's the measure. Does my net worth go up after I do this thing? That's probably what we should all be looking at. Now, you can just understand that in your brain, looking at something, or if you want to be formal about it, you can go get a balance sheet and an income statement with your entire personal net worth. Okay. And so the question is, what is your net worth? Most people don't know. What is your net worth? Your net worth does not mean, well, let's see, I can sell my house. I can sell my car. I could, that's not part of your net worth. Your net worth is includes assets that you have or that you have control of. Okay. Because sometimes they're outside of your estate. Your net worth does not include the house in which you live. It does not include the cars you drive generally, okay? So that's one idea is you have cash and you put it in tax lien certificates. The other idea is that you can get into something like um, instead of buying actual real estate, why not go through a business broker and look for a property management company? Now, here's what you're going to get with property management. The property manager is the one that takes 10% of the rents that come in from a customer. So the customer is a real estate investor that needs a property manager to go out there and respond to calls like the fixed stuff at the house. Okay. So there's a tenant and there's a property man. Uh, there's a, there's a property investor and then there's the manager. So the, so the investor is going to collect rents, but sometimes he has a vacancy rate and he's not getting rent. He's still paying 10% of the rent for, to the property manager. So you're going to reduce your volatility this way. And you're going to have an instant customer base. If you buy a property management firm, you're going to buy it based on the value of its books. Okay. It's books are valued on the cash flow from its customers. So the, here's the nice thing about this. That company typically has already un undertaken the risk in acquiring those customers and the costs associated with that. And you're buying in after the fact. And that's probably factored in the books to somewhat. That's that's a good thing. The other thing you're getting with a property manager is the, the value 
and and you're you're getting away from that that same uh depreciation let's call it when you when you buy a car a new car and you drive it off the lot right everybody knows that the value of the car goes down by 30 percent or something like that um if i buy this company a property management firm that firm has already vetted out the best plumbers contractors uh, electricians in that neighborhood in that market and so you're acquiring that list without incurring the cost that cost is already accounted for all right same thing with the customer acquisition it's already there you got brand name recognition you got presence and recognition in the marketplace okay you got your networks and affiliations we're not going to talk about that you got something else that's not going to show up on the books okay you buy an existing property management firm you're getting the intellectual property that was used the thinking the creativity the hard work that was used to build that now a lot of times they're not there's no valuation for that but you're going to get it so anyways that's what I would just look at if you're wondering what the heck is he talking about reallocating? I'm talking about that. Now, who says you have to buy the entire, for example, a property management firm? You don't. What if you just buy into one? Maybe one's worth $5 million and maybe you want to put a quarter million in. I'm just speaking hypothetically. If you put a quarter million dollars of your cash into it, why would the owner do that? Maybe he wants liquidity, right? Maybe he, maybe he could use a quarter million dollars in cash to go do something else or expand the business, right? And what you're doing is you're getting the benefit of that business's returns. So you let's say you uh, you get a broker to involve, because I would do it this way. I would get a broker and I would find one and I would make an offer. I'd have the broker make an offer, right? As soon as you make an offer, if it's, if it's accepted, by default, deals like that uh, fall through if you can't get financing. So th there's always a way out, okay? Um, but once you have the broker in there and your deal's accepted, your offer, then um, you can request the financials. I mean, sometimes you get the financials before, but you can get the financials, right? And then you can start looking at the books and see what's going on with the company and see if it, you know, if it makes sense or whatever. You can you can have a, an accountant advise you accordingly, okay? Um, you can compare that with maybe returns on some other opportunity. So I'm just saying it's limitless what you can do with cash now. Putting cash into an asset, that's what you and I always talk about. We're, you know, we're usually under a net worth of $5 million. So most of us are thinking, wow, now I have some cash and I can be an investor. Well, most investments that we see every day that we drive around town and we look at, those investments are made with other people's money. So the owner of those investments typically is using other people's money. So just keep that in mind. It's not a problem to get into what could be an asset or an asset with cash. Just know that lending is a way to offset your risk. So so an example would be, so because if I get into an asset, real estate, let's say, with cash, now I'm my own lender too, because the reason why I'm, I'm my own lender is because I can get loan money for that property, for that type of asset, but I'm not. So by default, I'm incurring that same type of activity. So I'm doing both. I'm owning real estate, but I'm also being my own lender. You really need to be get a real lender. And just because your grandmother has a lot of cash and she wants to lend you the cash to buy the asset, fine. You need to refinance her out too because she's not a lender either. Even though she has cash and she wants to loan it to you, a true lender is going to be someone who can offset his own risk. So a bank who lends money on a commercial deal, like let's say a hotel, the bank has the ability to make a phone call probably and offset the risk it took in lending you the money immediately. Okay, your grandmother can't do that. So just keep that in mind, nor can you. You shouldn't be able to do that. You're a real estate investor. You're not a lender. So just understand there's all these things going on. Uh, but you know that's what I'm saying. You can look at talking with maybe a business broker. I'm not that, but I I can guide you through that process. Well, Elaine, I missed the question about the, um, the tax liens. Where do you find? Um, okay, good question. All right. So if you want to get started on tax liens, just look at it. Um, there's many places, but I would just suggest going to uh, participate or join the membership, and you can do this for free, uh, of the Georgia Real Estate Investors Association out of Atlanta. Now, there's some other ones, but Georgia Real is very popular. Many of the real estate investors you'll find there, many of the names, the famous names out there like Ron Legrand, you'll find those guys probably on the board. Um, but it's the Georgia Real Estate Investors Association, and you're going to find people that are investors, you know, real estate investors. You're going to find wholesalers. You're going to find people that broker promissory notes for mortgages. Uh, you'll find lenders, and you'll find people that are buying and buying at auction. They're buying tax lien certificates. Uh, so uh, that's what I'd recommend. Just get into that group, find people, 
connect in. You're going to find out that to be effective in doing this stuff, you get, you get in with other people. So yeah, that would be the place to go.